has changed from something only utopians did into becoming the new normal. It is required of you, but it can still be a confusing landscape to navigate through. Welcome to the science conversations at NTNU. Today we'll talk about open access. With me today in the studio and on screen are three interesting and knowledgeable persons who can contribute to your and mine understanding of the topic. So, let's start with the most obvious questions. Alex Hansen, you're a professor in physics, an open publication veteran and editor of one of the big open access journals. What is open science? Well, let me say it this way, you know, science, that is building intellectual cathedrals. And the question is, should these cathedrals be open to the public? Or should it be for the people who are inside? But, so if open science uh, demands that research should be accessible to all. Uh, are you saying that that is not possible with the traditional way of doing things? No, and on many, le many levels. Uh, I mean, um, we're in the middle of a huge technological change now with the internet and, and uh, this easy access to, to uh, information. You know, I mean, we can in two days uh, amass as much uh, information as our grandparents did in a lifetime. There's, there's absolutely no, no comparison. And uh, the way that science is, has been, been um, uh, given to the public has been in an old way through libraries and so forth, and that system worked very, very, very well. But now there's a completely different uh, level of access. And simply we cannot use this old-fashioned way of, of, of uh, you know, having things in libraries. Libraries are a little bit, you know, yesterday, very much yesterday. Uh, we have to make it open, simply. Yeah. With today's technology, not with yesterday's technology. Uh, Henrik Karlström is with us here on screen. He works at the university library. Uh, might be outdated in some ways, but it's a, a very important resource for NTNU when it comes to open science. Uh, Henrik, could you please help me sort some of these terms out? Because you have, you have open science, you have open access, you have open data, you have open publications. Are these just uh, several names for the same thing? or how do they all fit together? I would say that they, um, they fit together in, if you look at open science as a, a full process um, of uh, making research uh, transparent um, throughout the entire research process. So traditionally, we have talked about things like open access. We have been talking about open access to the end product of the research process. So the final publication that results, that comes out of a research project and uh, where you describe the things you've done and your conclusions that arise from the process of research that you've been through. Um, however, when you talk about open science, we are also talking about the data that underlie um, the things you write in a publication, or we are talking about the methods. Uh, we are talking about um, increasing the transparency for how do we reach our conclusions as uh, scientists. So uh, open access is concerned with the end product of this process, while open science concerns the, the, the whole process from, uh, from the initial uh, definition of the research problem until the final product, which is uh, publication, and, and beyond through the communication efforts after you've published something. Okay, thank you. That makes that makes sense. Uh, Mai Tuchet, you're a professor in philosophy. You are the, the director of Programme for Applied Ethics, and you have been in the Research Ethics Committee. Why is open science important? 
I would say that the most important thing uh, with open science and open access uh, is uh, for everybody, for the whole of the society, not only other researchers, to access uh, uh, both data and the product of uh, um, uh, use of data. Uh, and I would also actually bring in um, um, uh, Antanu's uh, vision here. I mean, to produce knowledge uh, for a better world. And I think that's uh, what it uh, uh, intends to because uh, it used to be a case that uh, uh, the products of research was uh, mostly um, for those who could easily access it. So, so dissemination uh, is an important thing. And um, so, so I would say that it's, it's uh, both for the benefit of the research society, but also for the society at large. Um, so that's the, that's the, the shorter uh, issue. And I would, uh, we could come back to this perhaps, but uh, it's also uh, when thinking about research ethics, uh, uh, the, uh, the ethos or the idea behind open access uh, complies with uh, what we consider to be very important in research ethics. Uh, and I think I could take the opportunity to, to mention uh, what captures this ethos uh, is, uh, um, yeah, is kept in this uh, so-called kudos uh, concept, uh, which is actually an acronym. And it was Merton in 1942 uh, who first started to talk about it. But, uh, so it, we could say maybe it's a bit old fashioned, but it's not. And I think it's more important. So I just briefly uh, say something about uh, what um, kudos stands for. Uh, the C first stands for the communism, which is uh, not a political. <laughs> it's a, the, the very idea is that it's, a, it, it's about common knowledge um, or ownership of knowledge. And this common ownership is important. And then it's um, universalism, that's the U. Uh, which is about the disregard of who puts forward knowledge claims. So it's not what uh, journal, what publication, or what uh, author, but it's about uh, something which is uh, not to regard this. And uh, disinterestedness is another part of this uh, ethos, uh, which is that no, there should be no uh, value-based bias uh, and also no personal gain which is also an economic issue. And then uh, maybe the most important is the organized skepticism. <laughs> uh, we have a review, we have peer reviews, we have a research ethical committees. Um, uh, and the main thing is that uh, in order, not both for the research society, but also for the broader society to um, to be uh, to make sure that uh, the knowledge that is produced and disseminated is trustworthy and that's the reason why we also need this and the last uh, point is originality i mean the whole point of our research after all is uh, to produce something which is to, to go forward to produce something new rather than repeating what is already there so we're touching up on some really big fundamental questions here uh, Alex, um, do you think that open access is seen uh, differently in different research disciplines? You're from physics. Yeah. Yes, I mean, there are some <laughs> disciplines that are more conservative than others. And, and uh, uh, so definitely there, there, is, there is a difference. Uh, I can see that very clearly. Um, and it also has a little bit to do with, it, with the funding. I mean, some disciplines are simply more funded than others. And, and, but, you know, I mean, the whole dis uh, open access uh, movement, or whatever you should call it, is, is under development. It's not a finished uh, thing. Uh, what you've had is, is this huge shift in technology. And, and uh, what we now see very clearly is that the old models don't work anymore. And we have to find something new. But I don't think we have the ideal yet. So we have to work towards it. Yeah. And, and, uh, and that, I think, is why you see is some different levels of, of, um, of um, uh, attitude towards, towards open access. But let me say something, I mean, about, about open access. Uh, come back to your first question. 
Um, <coughs> you know, when you think about it, science, you know, that is that uh, you, you post, you make statements, you have ideas, and they are debated. And the way you debate it in, in science is through, through the re review process. And so forth, discussions at meetings and so forth. But when you think about it, that's also the essence of democracy. The, not, you know, that we have elections and so forth, but people come with ideas and these ideas are debated. And then you, f you find the best solution. And the thing now is that, you know, if, the, if you think about the way one is doing science now, it is, uh, these debates are behind closed doors. It's like the, uh, the parliament should have their doors closed and do things and you had to have pay a subscription to see what they're doing. That doesn't work. It's the same thing with science. I mean, if people think that the science uh, really is something we should not care about. I mean, look at pictures of the world from 1900 and compare them to pictures today. What's the difference? Well, that's the science that happens between 1900 and, 90 and 2021. It concerns everybody. It does. Uh, Henrik, uh, Alex uh, said that this is, a, this is a process. It's not finished yet. Uh, and I guess there are a lot of policies and rules and regulations do you is this something you see at your work at the university library uh, the, <coughs> that open science is uh, an ongoing work in progress you mean yeah. yeah yes yes definitely so it's still quite a new new thing um i'd say almost globally uh this new focus on uh on increasing uh transparency in, in science in this way. And uh, I, I do not think that we have found uh, the final form of what open science should look like or what form it should take. Um, but um, there is an ongoing discussion about where do the limits for, for this openness uh, lie. And obviously, we're talking about uh, research ethics as well. There are certainly some questions where some situations where the demand for openness can um, can uh, can butt up against other considerations that are of an ethical nature. So I think we're still uh, trying to figure out exactly where these delineations should, should go. Um, but uh, the general movement is in the direction of uh, better documentation of the research process and a more conscious effort on the part of researchers to try to make visible not just the end product, uh, the publications, but also the thinking that has gone into the design of the research pros uh, projects. Thank you. Um, so, as far as I can understand, up until now you could rely on these high-profile journals, like for instance Nature and Science, to, to share the results of high-quality research. And I guess that within some fields of research, the dream of many researchers would be to publish there. Uh, how has open science changed this? Do they still uh, do they strive to publish in these publications, Alex? Yes, I can. Or do you want to comment uh, straight away? Maybe I could just uh, briefly comment, and you can uh, <laughs> follow up. Uh, there's a lot to say about this, but I think uh, we really these days we have a tension because. Um, when looking at what uh, uh, commitments uh, NTNU has made uh, to this DORA declaration. DORA declaration is the San Francisco Declaration uh, on Research Assessment. Uh, so NTNU has signed this. And uh, one main point here is that um, we should eliminate use of journal-based uh, metrics uh, and uh, we should assess research uh, on its own merits, which means that we should not uh, no longer rely on the level of, uh, of, uh, of the uh, pub publication channel, uh, but we should rather get, uh, make an independent assessment of the contents um, uh, of, of the papers. And uh, this kind of scrutiny, I think it uh, might be a risk that it's uh, compromised as long as we still, because if you see what is the practice today, well, uh, you are uh, rewarded if you publish in a level two uh, uh, journal rather than a one, because uh, the institution gets more money. Uh, so I think this is an issue that it's, uh, it's, uh, there's a tension between um, uh, how we uh, imagine that we can uh, 
uh, follow up on the ideals of open access because I think everyone is actually, uh, or most people uh, in our institution think it's a good idea. But when it comes to how do we act in order to obtain uh, the, the results, I think uh, we have some challenges here. So, as a, yeah. Sorry, as an editor, uh, Alex, I guess you have, you sort of really feel this. How can, uh, can you, how do you achieve both openness and, and quality? This is something you work with all the time, I guess. I see absolutely zero, zero uh, uh, correlation between these two things. I mean, um, um, open access is what happens to the paper after it's been published. I mean, all the quality assessments and so forth happens before. Uh, and um, okay, the, the, the standard argument against uh, open access is that uh, the income uh, to the journal comes per article published. So that's an incentive to publish everything that, that moves, basically. And, um, but of course, <laughs> I mean, the only real asset that the journal has is its reputation. If the reputation goes down the drain, People won't uh, submit there. People will know that uh, if something is submitted, I mean, published there, I mean, it's, it's worth nothing. So these journals die. That's the typical uh, pirate journals. And, and there are, they are, exist now because uh, the open access uh, thing is so young, but they will surely die. There is a Darwinian process going on. Uh, as for, for uh, your previous question, which I really didn't answer, um, the one about nature and science and these sort of high prestige, very, very high prestige journals. They, they operate according to the same principle as a luxury industry, the French luxury industry, right? They make it difficult to get access. Uh, luxury industry through have high prices, that makes it very uh, attractive because you're sending a statement. And here you make it very, very difficult to get um, get published. However, how did they do that? Well, the question they ask to the, to the reviewers, and they have also a panel always uh, themselves, is this important? Is this work important? But how on earth can a person have any opinion about that before it has actually hit the scientific community? So I regard that as a profoundly unscientific question. And that's the one they use. And luckily what is happening now, I mean, you, you, that trend hasn't really developed, but it is certainly coming, absolutely guaranteed coming. Namely that, that um, the publication channel is becoming less and less important, exactly what you said. Uh, and why is that? Well, you have, for example, Scholar Google, which can pinpoint articles without where they come from at all. And you can really mm -hmm. check, find out how that piece of work is doing with the rest of, 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 um, of uh, the scientific society. So my prediction is that this kind of um, you know, scientific luxury industry is, 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 is uh, moribund. It's not going to survive in the long run. Mm. Uh, if I could just uh, comment uh, shortly on this, uh, because I think uh, I think you are quite right. I think we are on the right track, and and uh, and uh, we will uh, uh, make the systems work uh, the way we want them to. Uh, but I think there is a challenge uh, for the individual researcher, especially young people, uh, to to have the sufficient overview and to understand uh how to navigate or because uh, as an experienced uh, professor you would know all this you know what to look for so i think that's also uh, a challenge uh, uh, with this new system if, if you ask an average uh, phd may maybe in some fields they are quite knowledgeable but i think very many uh, are not so so uh, i think uh, there's also uh, a knowledge gap probably here within academia comment on that yeah not only by the, uh, among the phds i mean students i mean look in, in chrono and, and uh, in universities and other places where these are debated i mean the science is full of of, of dinosaurs <laughs> at the professorial level that that lives in the past and and uh, 
they argue, they're of course very good at arguing because that's what they've done all their life. But if you look at really uh, the, the real reason you find that so many of the old people are, are against open access is basically that they, they don't like getting a bill on their table they have never seen before. I mean, that, I think that's it. Um, and then you have some main policies for open access and open publication. And uh, as Alex referred to here, a lot of people uh, perhaps don't know about these. Is it possible to sum up, like, I don't know, the three most important things that researchers should know about the policies and what they're required to do? Um. <laughs> That's a, that's a tall order. Um, so I think um, I'm not going to answer very, uh, the way you want me to. I think I'm going to say that uh, NTNU as an institution uh, is working towards making the transition to uh, this uh, the new demands on documentation, on openness, on transparency. Um, uh, the load that is placed on the researchers as light as possible. So basically our new policies say that uh, uh, new publications should be made openly available, preferably at the time of publication. Um, you should deposit uh, research data where possible and practical um, uh, when uh, after processing and, and publication of the results. Um, and everything should be made uh, as openly as possible and as, uh, and as close as, uh, as they have to be. Uh, but the, the main um, uh, thing that I would like researchers at NTNU to to be aware of is that we are really working to make towards making this process as painless as possible for the individual researchers. So um, traditionally, as Alex said, uh, the researchers have not had um, have never seen the bill for what they are uh, consuming of, of of scientific literature because uh, we at the library have have paid for reading access to to that sort of thing and the ideal. In the future, is that the uh, anything the organization of payment for publication should also be done at the institutional level, so that the individual researcher shouldn't really have to care about uh, these monetary issues. It's not it's something that should be solved on an institutional level. So, so the message is, um, I think the researcher has to make a transition towards thinking about how they can uh, increase the transparency uh, of what they're doing in, in all throughout the research process. And that, that puts an extra load on them when it comes to uh, documentation. But all the other parts uh, we should we are striving to handle as an institution so that we can continue to uh, to 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 foot the bill for open access and also to provide their infrastructure that researchers need to do to meet these new demands on documentation and, and accountability that uh, that we are meeting. Thanks. Uh, yeah, you had a comment. Yeah, uh, just a short comment because uh, I think uh, if, if we ask uh, <laughs> go back to what, what is the main point uh, of open science, open access. It is to enable uh, researchers to keep sufficient immaterial rights uh, to comply with the open access demand. And uh, we know there are differences. I mean, our institution pays uh, money to, to different publication channels. So I think there, uh, I think you are quite right. We need a uh, lot of transparency here. But I, I wonder how much uh, actually the individual uh, researcher uh, should care about this. I mean, it's an institutional responsibility, but it's also a choice uh, that the individual re researcher has. So I think there is, uh, um, because I think that there are different licenses and, and uh, the, how much uh, of the non or immaterial property or property rights uh, you give away uh, and uh, how much uh, can be used for com commercialization. So who is after all making most money on this? And I, I know it's very complex, but maybe you could uh, say something. Yeah, uh, I guess you had an answer yeah. to that, Henrik. Yeah, so, I mean, this, this is one of the goals of, of transitioning to this, to this open access world. So uh, one thing is to enable uh, anyone to read the, the results of research that in, in, for the most part is, is publicly funded and, and should be publicly available. 
but um, uh, it's also uh, the new open access publishing uh, ways of publishing, they carry with them a guarantee that the researchers uh, keep and maintain uh, the intellectual property that they uh, produce when they produce a, a work of, of uh, research or a scientific publication. So the old model used to be when you published in a journal, you would sign off all rights to the work uh, to the journal and, and basically give them ownership of everything uh, to the extent that if you wanted to reuse one of your own uh, graphs or uh, other parts of, an, of a previous uh, publication, you would have to ask particular permission or in some cases even pay to use your own work because uh, you have signed off the ownership to that work to the, to the publisher. Uh, with the new open access uh, uh, licenses, one of the uh, core uh, aspects of them, in addition to the right to, to read and distribute the work, is that the uh, ownership to the intellectual property that that publication represents stays with the researcher. Uh, and so uh, you maintain uh, intellectual ownership of your own work. So uh, I see this as a, as a, it should be seen as a, as a great uh, boon to, to researchers that they are no longer giving up uh, uh, total control of, of what they're producing simply for the right to have their name on a publication in, in, some, uh, in some journal. Uh, we've gotten a question from the audience. Uh, where can I find information uh, about open access at NTNU? Funny you should ask that. Because uh, Ingrid Hegeland at the University Library has made a two-minute video about exactly that. So I think we'll see the video right away. NTNU's vision is knowledge for a better world. To help achieve this, NTNU has an open science policy. The goal is that research and science at NTNU should be accessible, reproducible and reusable. As a researcher at NTNU, you have access to tools and resources to help you get started with open science. One important aspect of open science is open access to publications. The publishing page at INSEA helps you get started and gives you relevant information. This includes the policy for open science at NTNU and also more practical information like what agreements do we have with publishers? Check whether your journal is part of the agreements. Other options might be to upload your manuscript to Kristin and make sure it's published with green open access. More detailed information is available on several wikis. If you can't find the information you are looking for, you can contact the publishing group at the University Library. In addition to open access to publications, other research outputs can also be published openly. For example, research data and source code. The research data page at INSEA gives you relevant information about how to handle and share and publish research data. You can, for example, publish your research data alongside your publications at NTNU Open Research Data, our own repository for research data. We also have information on how to set up a data management plan. If you need more information, we also have courses in the virtual library and other online courses on topics like open access publishing and research data management. You can always contact us at researchdata at NTNU Yelp for more information, advice and guidance. And remember, your research should always be as open as possible, as closed as necessary. Thank you, Ingrid. So to sum up, the university library is your friend, INSEA is your friend. There you can find information about requirements and the publishing process, how to handle research data, how to choose where to publish, how to apply for NTNU's publishing fund for more uh, open access and much more. My, in the video, uh, Ingrid just said that research should be as open as possible and as close as necessary. What does that mean from an ethical perspective? Uh, there are several things to say. I mean, um, uh, it, uh, 
complies uh, with the, the basic ideas that it should be open, it should be accessible to everyone. Uh, but what exactly does it mean that it should be accessible to everyone? It also means that uh, uh, the use and reuse of data uh, is also uh, a bit out of control. I mean, that's a consequence of having uh, open uh, uh, open uh, science and, and uh, open access, which means uh, that the possibilities uh, for uh, misuse uh, or, or to use uh, important sensitive data for uh, harmful purposes uh, is something, uh, is, is an, another risk that follows. So I think this is something uh, we haven't uh, yet thought much about. I mean, we know a lot about some of these risks because we have a huge debate going when it comes to, um, to all the data that are gathered about us. And, and, but, but also the fact that there is no longer the institutions who can keep it uh, to their, uh, within uh, uh, their own domain. It's also uh, possible for people who are good at uh, hacking or to, to get the information uh, they want to and use it for uh, different purposes. I mean, it could be terrorist groups, of course, but, but also uh, this uh, movement away from the institutional, um, uh, in a way, uh, home uh, of scientific knowledge uh, to something which is uh, also out there in the society. So I mean, there is also this, what you used to call this Janus phase. It's, it's for the good and for the bad, uh, forward looking, uh, backward looking. But I think that the main point is that um, um, we cannot control uh, what we leave open, uh, free, uh, for everyone to use. So I think these systems uh, need to, we need to establish uh, systems uh, that um, might protect us. And I think uh, the best way of doing this is actually to teach uh, scientists, uh, not only PhDs, but people in our institutions, uh, research ethics. I think that's uh, something that uh, could help a bit to, to, uh, to understand um, when uh, should we be uh, restrictive and when should we not be restrictive about uh, leaving open uh, data? Because it's, uh, we are not only talking about uh, journals uh, or publications in journals, but also all the data that can be used. And uh, I also uh, know from Alexe, you mentioned that uh, uh, you have some colleagues that uh, are a bit hesitant to, to having, uh, for instance, PhDs from just any country in the world. So the, I think that this points to, to also a risk here about uh, um, this very positive idea also has its, uh, um, yeah. So, uh, so research ethics can sort of provide with a, a compass for helping navigate through this. But we have a question from the audience, uh, and I guess it's a question you could have gotten from any PhD candidate of yours, uh, Alex. How do I know how open I may publish my data? They are mm. right in the middle of things. Mm. Uh, things are sort of developing, but they need an answer now. What would you have uh. said? We're talking now about uh, publishing it through a publication, for example, and uh, and if you use a CC BY um, uh, license, I think things are, are okay. Modulo, what was just said here about mm. uh, these ethical questions, I mean, if you're dealing with things that, that you know can be of danger, I mean, misuse directly, one has to be careful and think about it. But. There are not many people who do, who do that kind of research. In my own research, I've only encountered that a very few times, that I've had to uh, do ethical choices. But apart from these things, I, I think that one should be as open as possible. I mean, after all, I mean, it is the, um, the public who pays us, and they have a right to know what we're doing, all of it. Uh, my, we have a follow-up question from the audience. Where may I learn more about research ethics? Uh, if you're talking about NTNU, uh, there are, there are uh, actually some courses established. Uh, uh, one digital course that is now uh, mandatory for all uh, PhDs. Uh, and um, like people from the uh, program for applied ethics are involved in, in teaching in uh, uh, 
PhD courses uh, where they saw all. Uh, all. Um, after we got this new um, uh, research uh, uh, act from 2017, it's uh, also mandatory for the universities of Norway uh, to teach uh, their uh, PhDs. Uh, but uh, I must say we, we still uh, have a problem because uh, we also have people who <laughs> have been there for a while and who <laughs> are not necessarily that much into research ethics. But I think um, uh, what we need to do is to to, um, to do not only a short mandatory course as we have established now, and uh, but also to to keep talking about this, to to, to turn uh, the ethical aspects uh, into um, the research uh, debates as such, because there's a very close link between knowledge produ production and uh, ethics, uh, and uh, if. Uh, uh, it's not ethically okay, it's probably also not uh, trustworthy knowledge uh, that is produced. Uh, and there's a lot to be more to be said about it, but I, uh, I think that um, uh, for PhDs it's, uh, it's uh, quite easy because there are some things you have to do and the faculties are also mandated to, to follow up with uh, more thorough courses uh, in, in research ethics. But I think it's... Um, it's, uh, you also mentioned, Alex, earlier on uh, democracy. It's not only about research itself. So I think this uh, societal, um, uh, societal frame of, of research is becoming more and more urgent to, to understand because many of the PhDs uh, or who are educated uh, in our institution, they go to companies and, and other institutions uh, who may not necessarily um, stick to the same. So, but I think it's, it's a very good idea to, um, to become aware of uh, what commitments you actually are making when you get into research. I mean, it's towards your uh, mates, your colleagues, of course, but it's also towards the, the and, and of course the research subjects, uh, but also the rest of society. And it becomes particularly important, I think, when, it, when you talk about technologies, emerging te technologies, where you cannot actually foresee, that's the whole point, you cannot foresee all future use of, it, of them. Uh, um, but but we, we we still need to to um, <laughs> um, to try to, to, to test our own imagination yeah, and ask some basic questions whether this could be used for a purpose that I didn't intend it to be used for. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, from the basic questions that you have to consider as a researcher. I have a very practical one, uh, and I'll address that to you, Henrik, because Ingrid, Ingrid mentioned in the video uh, green open access. Can you uh, tell us shortly what that is? Yeah. <clears throat> so in the open access world, there is a, there's a whole plethora of colors that you can uh, yeah, you may have to deal with when it comes to open access. So basically, uh, it has to do with when uh, or what kind of manuscript are you making openly available? So um, there are different routes to making research openly available. Um, there, when Usually when we talk about open access, we are talking about uh, the, the model that Alex was describing earlier, where uh, you publish in a journal where you uh, pay the journal a fee to make the, the publication uh, itself openly available at the time of publication. And this is one route, and it's often called the gold gold open access route. Um, however, some uh, publishers do not offer this option, uh, or sometimes uh, there might be monetary reasons for why you don't um, you don't uh, go for this. You will always have the possibility to uh, deposit a version of your publication in an institutional repository, and this is known as green open access. And uh, you can make uh, the authors accepted manuscript uh, available through a, a repository instead of the actual publication. And so there's always a possibility to make the content of your research openly available uh, in some way or another. Um, so, so this is what is meant by green open access. And it's, uh, it's how we are trying to achieve uh, the maximal share of open access publication uh, at NTNU by, by a combination of 
is immediately open, uh, openly available uh, uh, publishers' versions, and the authors accepted manuscripts uh, through our uh, institutional repository, NTNU Open. And uh, at the INSEA webpage for publication, you can you can find more information about how you uh, go about uh, archiving your publications in NTNU Open to fulfill the open access mandate, even for those publications um, that are not uh, made open access through the, the, the journal you're publishing. Thank you, Henrik. Um, Alex, you have many young researchers in your research group, mm -hmm. and they are affected by uh, the open science um, processes. Uh, what would you say are the main responsibilities of supervisors uh, when it comes to open science? Yeah, um, of course, um, <coughs> these young scientists have to make a career. And, and uh, what you have to do is to, to help them the best you can. I mean, find the, the proper balances. And uh, one thing, of course, is to get them as many citations as possible for, for their papers. and. and that certainly is open access. There's a huge difference between um, you know, things behind paywalls and, and open mm. access. But then comes the question, and that really has to do with, with open access or not, but this is a question I myself is struggling with. Uh, because, you know, as a very well-established uh, you know, uh, scientist, uh, when I publish something, I want to address my community. I mean, uh, I want them to learn what I'm doing so that they can you know, get that into their work and so forth, that we have this interplay. Uh, the need for young scientists is, of course, to get a job. And the way to do that is to have something to show for you. And that's when you go for these high profile, big deal, journals, which are really glossy magazines in reality, I would say, some of them. And um, so the, they, they need to, to find a balance between uh, that struggle of, of trying to dumb down, sorry, <laughs> uh, to, to publish there, because they have to write for a wide audience, and then really to give all the details and then really be heard by the community you belong to. Mm. And for me, that's, I, I have not been able to find an answer, so I try to do a, do a little bit of both. Mm. Yeah. Sure. yeah, I think uh, we are touching upon something very basic. It's not only that uh, we had this tension between the DORA declaration and uh, the old system and the new system, open uh, access, uh, uh, rather than first looking at the level of the journals. But I think uh, <coughs> what is required here is a change of the culture. And, and I think it's an institutional responsibility. Uh, because uh, I think uh, many people in our institution uh, struggle with exactly this. Mm. What should we choose? But I think it's good to, to bring this up and, and continue debating it. Yeah, I think that um, uh, in the end, if I now taking a broader view of this, what is best for science and what is best for science is best for humanity. Mm. And that is that you should forget about these hoity-toity journals and go for the, the ones that actually address the right communities. Because is it important enough, it will be spread out anyway. We are approaching the end and I will let that be your take-home message for the day, Alex. Okay. Henrik, do you have a take-home message for the audience? I think... Um, well, I, I just want to say it's a, this is a, a good discussion. I think the take-home message is that uh, we are all uh, trying to navigate our way through a quite complex field here. And uh, I think as an individual researcher, uh, if you make it your your um, your modus operandi to, to try and uh, think carefully about how you approach your, the research process and uh, what you can do to 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 document what you are doing uh, better. Then we, as an institution, will try and help you as best as we can to help you achieve those goals and to make the transition to a more open, more transparent, more accountable uh, science uh, as, as painless as possible. 
Thank you, Henrik. What about you, Mai? I think we are, all the three of us are, are quite in agreement here. Uh, so I think uh, what we need to struggle with is uh, how to get there. Uh, and uh, what I believe is that uh, we should, uh, of course, make sure that uh, what we produce uh, of knowledge should be for the benefit of the research society as well as uh, the broader society. Uh, and uh, then we, which brings us back to, to how to make, uh, to turn NTNU into um, an institution producing knowledge uh, for a better world. Uh, there is, uh, I think, the best uh, thing we can do is to keep uh, de debating these uh, tensions we still have mm -hmm. and have a broader discussion, not only here, but all over in our institution. It's a very good point. Today, has you have heard about open access and some of the aspects it entails. We hope that you've learned something useful and that you've gotten some new ideas. The next science conversation will be on December 2nd and we'll talk about how to build a good research environment in your group. I hope to see you there. And in the meantime, keep the conversation going. <laughs>